Hi, my name's Helen. Welcome to my home. It's a pleasure to have your company. Thanks for dropping in. Um, so we're looking at the word abide. So I looked it up in the English dictionary because it's always a good place to start. And in the English dictionary, abide means to live, to dwell, to act in accordance with or in agreement of. And that's it. Very simple. But when I looked it up in the Hebrew, because that's what spiritual people do, right? I certainly wanted to look spiritual for you all today. So I looked it up and it actually really ministered to me. Listen to the Hebrew um, description of the word abide and make it personal. It's as though he's saying stay, remain. Would you just rest, abide? Would you be left over in the habit? Stay, would you tarry, pause for a while? Linger, would you persist, pursue? This one makes me laugh. Put up with, <laughs> stand, endure. Would you tolerate? <laughs> yeah, I know exactly how, yeah, tolerate. I know that word, I know that word. It's a holy invitation into the rest and into the joy and into Christ himself. It's just, it's an invitation to the Sabbath, I suppose, you could say. So as I start to think about well, what scripture shall I lean upon, Lord? Because there's loads of scriptures that invite you into him. And uh, the one that I felt most drawn to was John 15, verse 7, where it says, If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you desire and it will be given to you. Sorry, say that again. Anything I desire will be given to me. I mean, it sounds amazing, right? You've got to be really careful not to skip over the very first word. It's a little itty bitty two letter. for your good what the devil meant for harm he's going to turn it around for your good but we don't put the next part of the scripture we omit the clause that we omit the condition which is he will turn things around for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes well how would we know if you love him or not if you obey him and so you start to see that these promises exist with conditions um, not as a test, but actually to grow us, to take us from one degree of glory to another, to disciple us, yeah? Otherwise, we'd just be a bunch of spoiled kids roaming the earth, you know, and just totally spoiled. So this is why God does that. And, and in this particular verse of scripture, it says, if you abide in me. So what is it to abide? Well, I love it that it, when you look at the whole um, chapter in John 15, Jesus uses one of his I am statements. He says, I am the true vine. In some versions of the Bible, it says, I'm the real vine, the real deal. I'm the one that you can trust. I'm the true vine and you are the branches. And the father is the gardener. And so what he is saying there is you're connected to me. And then Father Gardener is going to come and he's going to see how well you're doing. How, how is your fruit? And it says in that scripture that when the father looks upon a branch, if it's bearing fruit, he'll prune it, which can be a bit stingy and a bit, it can be painful when the Lord prunes you, but he prunes you so that you'll be more productive. And so it's important that we don't just equate every trial that we face and every pruning season we, we ought not to give the credit to the devil sometimes the lord is doing a good work in us that's going to bring us to a place of growing up and a place of much more productivity um, it's definitely been the case in my life 
Um, and then you've got other branches that are simply not producing any fruit whatsoever. And it says they'll just get cut off entirely. So listen, where are you at today? The fruit of the spirit, and you know, this is a great indicator of whether or not we are connected to the vine. Amen. So the fruit of the spirit, of course, is love, is joy, it's peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So if those things are on every day, kind of through the day display, well done, good and faithful servant. All is well and you're obviously abiding in Christ. But when those things aren't so um, commonplace, say, for instance, you find yourself um, in a bit of a bitter, twisted place, or maybe rather than responding, you're reacting. Um, could I just maybe suggest that you need some time alone with Jesus? And, uh, you know, everyone's going to thank you for it. So my husband loves it if I spent time with Jesus. I'm like really cool. It's a bit like the Elton John advert where he needs a Snickers, you know, and it just totally changes your personality. Well, the fruit of the spirit changes your personality for sure, for the better. So listen, that's a great indicator. If you're not bearing any of those fruit, then you need to spend time with Jesus. Make time. Be very intentional about the time that you're spending with him. And it will always be good. Not just for you, but for everyone. Hallelujah. There's a great old hymn. You'll know this hymn. It's an old English hymn written by an Anglican minister back in the 1800s. Um, it's, it's, his name is Henry uh, Light and he based this hymn on a conversation he had with a friend. He was at his bedside, his deathbed actually, and they were discussing the road to Emmaus and Luke 24. And this song was birthed out of that conversation. Abide with me. This song, yeah? Fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. And it speaks about this incoming darkness, this evening that is coming um, closer and it's just saying, Lord, abide with me. And in Luke 24, it's exactly what's happening. You've got these two guys who have just witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus, who was the one they put all of their hope in. Like they really did believe that this was the Messiah and this was the one who was going to come and free them from the reign of terror of the Romans, that he was going to bring liberty in every kind of way. And all of their hopes were dashed that Good Friday when they watched him die on a cross. In fact, they were probably too nervous to go watch him die on a cross, but they heard it happened and that was good enough for them. Of course, they now heard rumours from the women in the community that he had indeed risen from the dead. That wasn't enough for them, apparently. So they didn't believe that part of it. I don't think they did. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been so downcast, right? So their heads were bowed low. They walked with great depression and very much. They were just gutted, gutted to the core. Anyway, the stranger sides up to them and says, what are you guys talking about? And they look at him as if he's crazy. Like, what do you mean, what are we talking about? What else is there to talk about? Jesus, crucified. Where have you been? Jesus then goes on to talk to them about the context. <clears throat> he starts to talk to them about the, the, the prophetic words that had come hundreds of years before. He said, I, are you so shocked that this man who they've crucified had to go through punishment to bring about this incredible freedom that you're talking about? Why are you so shocked that this might be the avenue or the tool that God would use? When in Isaiah, it's so clear that he was bruised for our iniquities. He was punished. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. He'd be, he'd be, um, his stripes would bring us our healing. You know, there was, there was this exchange. Why are you so shocked that such a graphic and um, painful situation um, would be the avenue that God would choose to bring about um, the glorious end result. Like, why are you so shocked? And he started to just teach them along the way. They obviously loved his company, who wouldn't? Because after those seven miles of walking with him, the, the darkness was coming in, drawing in, nighttime was coming, and they said, listen, please don't go. 
It says that they constrained him to stay with them. Literally, they forced him, if you like, to stay with them. They said, please don't leave. Look, you carry on your journey tomorrow, but as for tonight, come and eat with us. Abide with us. Please come in and abide with us. And of course, Jesus loves that invitation. And so he went in and he abided with them. And it wasn't until he offered them communion that they recognised who he was and the Bible says he immediately disappeared before their very eyes. What a miracle. I wonder if you were only allowed to have one desire, what would that desire be? If you were limited and there was just one thing that you were allowed to desire, one thing that would be granted to you, you know, like desert island discs, they always gave you three options, right? Well, I'm not even giving you three. Let's say there's just one option. King David, shows us in Psalm 27 and he said this one thing I have desired this one thing will I seek for that I will dwell in the house of the Lord that he will be abiding with God that's the one thing because he knew that if he sought first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness then everything else would be given to him he just got it he just grasped it after living the life he lived a varied full crazy life good stuff, bad stuff, rich stuff, poor stuff, just craziness. Um, after all of those years, he said, there's only one thing that remains. There's only one thing that's important. Mary knew what was important. Mary and Martha, when Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus, when there was work to be done, but she chose to abide with him. She chose to sit and listen to him. And Jesus turns to Martha, who's complaining like anything, and says she chose the better part. Mary chose well. She chose to abide with me. This is the one thing. Some of the women who are listening will be able to um, understand where I'm coming from with this. Um, I was pregnant um, and I remember I stopped eating the food that I normally ate and I just craved particular things. So depending on what part and what trimester I was in, I, my body seemed to tell me what it was that that baby needed. And so I would find times and seasons where I was eating things with calcium in, a lot of cheese and dairy products. And then there were other times during other trimesters where I wanted to eat oily fish and I needed salt and sodium. And there was stuff going on in my body that that's what I required. You know, in the same way, when we are so connected to the vine, when we're so um, abiding in Christ, the desires of our heart begin to morph and they're no longer the desires of our flesh. They're no longer the desires of who we once were, but they are the desires of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They're desires that um, are most equated to who we are in our unique self. And I don't even think we know who our unique self truly is. But he does. He knows what we need and he knows the desires of our heart even before we do. Just as it says in Psalm 139, he knows exactly what we're going to say before we even say it. He knows our thoughts from afar off. He knows the desires of our hearts. And as we delight ourselves in him, it gives him great pleasure to give us the desires of our hearts. In a moment, we're going to pray. But before we do, I just want to highlight one other truth, one other, um, one other promise of God, which is dependent and conditional. You see, God's love is not conditional. God is an unconditionally loving God. It's who he is. He can't be anything other than that because he is love. I, I guarantee you, if you're watching me right now and you're not a Christian, you may have lived any kind of a life, a good life, a bad life, it makes no difference. God simply loves you. I can say it with absolute security and confidence. God loves you. But here is a, a, a promise in the Bible which is key for you today. It's John 3 16 and it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life and a life in abundance. Now, if you want that everlasting life and life in abundance, then there's a condition. And the condition is this, you must believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes would not perish, but have everlasting life. 
If you would like to enter into the joy of the Lord, if you'd like to enter into this Christian life, this walk, this way of living, I want to just invite you right now to just hand your life over to Jesus. You can trust him. Remember what he said, I'm the true vine. I'm the real deal. I'm the real McCoy. You can trust me um, with your life. So let me lead you in a prayer. Father God, I know that I have sinned and I've fallen short of your glory. There are days when I haven't even believed you existed and days when I've no doubt done things that you would not want to see or know about. But God, here you are, knowing my history, knowing the number of hairs on my head, seeing my past, my present and my future. Oh, Lord God, would you take away the sin in my life? Would you remove it as far as the east is from the west so that I could start again? I want to press a reset button on my life and start fresh. I want to start over. So God, I'm going to repent and I'm going to turn and I'm going to live as closely with you as I can. I'm going to follow the teachings of Jesus. Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit and would you abide in me, I pray. I believe that Jesus is your son and that he died on a cross more than 2,000 years ago. And that three days later, he rose from the dead and he walked around and he met many people, including those two guys on the road to Emmaus. And just like them, I want to invite you in and I want to eat with you and I want to abide with you and you with me. I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. Amen. And for those of you who right now are really battling with this season of darkness, with this political landscape, with all that's going on, if you are feeling in fear, if you are feeling that you're, you're a bit shaken, um, I just want to say, look, abide in Christ. He is unchanging, unwavering. He's still sitting on the throne. Remember what it says in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? He is the strength of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? And then it goes on in verse four of that same psalm saying everything that I've tried to say but saying it so succinctly King David says this one thing will I seek one thing will I seek for that I will live in the house of the Lord that I would abide with him all the days of my life my friends be blessed have a fantastic day and you know there's this really kind of common song that we sing in the church but may it be freshly applied. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord, yes, Lord, may your presence be with us. Amen.